Peter is the, uh, the Burton Chair of Neurology at the University of Glasgow. And uh, you've seen that he's talking today on um, sleeping sickness, but I really know him in the, his context of, the context of his work as a neurovirologist. Um, Peter trained at the National Hospital um, in Queen Square, which is uh, pr pr probably the most famous institute of neurology in the world. We overlap there. We just learned this last night, probably by about three to six months. He also trained at University College London and spent a great deal of time at Johns Hopkins. He has many awards, including the CBE and various Royal Society memberships. He's well known for his work on VZV, and, uh, and I also didn't know this until last night. He was the first one to describe CMV as the cause of retinopathy in HIV AIDS. But today he's going to be talking to us about something completely different, which has occupied a great deal of his life. Um, I think it's some 30 trips over the past 18 years, or was it 18 trips over 30 years? Something it's like about 23 that. of us. <laughs> Something, Something like, like that. that. And but any of it, he's he's written a very elegant book on his experiences with uh, studying uh, tsetse fly and manifestations of infections associated with their bites. And he'll tell us about that today. Thanks, Peter. Ian, thank you very much indeed uh, for that introduction. Thank you very much for. Uh, inviting me to talk to you. It's an honor and a pleasure uh, to come here. Uh, great to visit this, uh, uh, this center. I've been inspired already. I'm going to spend the next 45 or 50 minutes talking about uh, a sleeping sickness uh, uh, or human African tryptosomiasis. Uh, I call it sleeping sickness because it's easier. Uh, I've been studying this, as Ian says, um, for uh, many years. What we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, history and then this will be quite a clinical talk to tell you about the clinical features and then uh, in the second part we'll talk about the pathogenesis and in the third part I'm going to tell you about some work that's uh, very recently come out of uh, my laboratory in Glasgow uh, work which we are really quite excited about. And we're going to go at, uh, uh, at, at, at quite a rate because many of you will not be that familiar with sleeping sickness so I'm going to take you through it. Okay. So historical milestones. People knew that in cattle and humans there was this disease, uh, a wasting disease in cattle, and also this disease causing people to sleep and get and die. Uh, and it was also known that this, this was uh, had a latitudinal uh, a determinant that in sub-Saharan Africa is where this happened. But it was really at the, at the end of the 19th century that this was the key period. Now, whenever you see anything in yellow, that means it's important. So David Bruce, uh, who was a Scottish microbiologist, uh, was, uh, uh, went to uh, Zululand uh, in Africa, and he was uh, uh, studying the Ghana, which was this wasting disease in cattle. And basically, he and his wife did some elegant experiments, and they showed that these triplosomes, uh, the uh, protozoan parasites, uh, were in the blood of infected cattle. And he showed that this tsetse, the tsetse fly, this fly was... Uh, uh, biting the, uh, the uh, animals in the wild and then infecting domestic uh, animals. He, interestingly, he thought it was due to an, a mechanical transmission, but we know it's more complicated than that. In 1899, he called uh, Tretosoma brucei. So whenever you see brucei, that refers to David Bruce. And then uh, in 1902, Everett Dutton identified in a European patient a T. brucei gambiense. Of course, the Gambia is on the west side. And then in 1903, like Aldo Castellani, a very interesting man. He was a, a young 24-year-old microbiologist, famous Florentine family. Uh, he was actually Mussolini's doctor for 20 years, which is interesting as well, <laughs> worth reading his, uh, bio his autobiography. And he found that triplosomes were present in the CSF of a patient. Now, he uh, used centrifugation, which was a critical step. It's controversial because David Bruce was sent out to work with him uh, in the uh, uh, first Royal Society Commission on Sleeping Sickness. But nevertheless, he was the first. And then uh, in 1910, uh, Stevens and Fanthorpe uh, described TB rhodesiense, which is the East African form. This is a picture of David Livingston. Uh, I'm just quite amazed uh, how young he was when he died. Um, uh, he, of course, is extremely well known to, to you. Also, uh, 
uh, Scottish uh, from, from Blantyre, and he, uh, is, as, you, as you know, uh, was a famous African explorer, uh, missionary, anti-slavery uh, 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 worker, and he uh, first gave arsenic to an infected uh, animal. In fact, he wrote a, a letter in the British Medical Journal uh, in, the, in the middle of the 19th century, and he said he gave arsenic and barley water to a horse that had been st uh, stricken with a fly disease, which only occurs in certain latitudes. And the fly got better, so, sorry, the, the horse got better, but then uh, a few months later it got worse again. And he says, wouldn't take the second dose. The, the horse looked at him and said, I'd rather die of the disease than this doctor. And that was arsenic. And what you'll find is, as I'll tell you, arsenic is still used even at this time. Some facts, TB uh, Rhodesiense, East African form, Gambiense, the West African form. But about 60 million people are at risk from getting it. This is in 36 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, out of a total of 52 countries. Transmitted by the tsetse fly, there are 30 different species of tsetse fly, but only about eight of them are economically important and transmit. The invasion of the central nervous system leads to a meningoencephalitis, which is invariably fatal. There aren't many diseases that are always fatal, but this is one of them. Although, as I'll show you, everything changes. Even very recently, there's some evidence that there are a few patients who may be resistant. Melosoprol is an arsenical that's given when the CNS is involved in one type, now the Rhodesiense, and it is effective in both types. This treatment kills 5% of patients from a reaction. So everyone dies untreated, 10% of patients get this reaction, half whom die. So this kills 5%, which is an extraordinary statistic. This uh, shows um, uh, a map of the instance. You'll see the areas in red, and um, I don't know how good your geography is, but basically what you're looking at is um, on top Sudan, uh, and then um, a, a, a Sudan, and then you've got Uganda, and then you've got the DRC, and then you've got Angola. Interestingly, these are areas in which you've, you've had war. Uh, and you'll see that the sub-Saharan uh, regions are affected. You look above in North Africa, Egypt, and look down at South Africa, and it does not occur. This, in fact, shows the rough distribution of the two types of, uh, of um, a sleeping sickness. On the whole, on the west and east, however, in Uganda, uh, is the only place where you've got both types of, of, uh, of sleeping sickness, the west, western and the east, both types, and they're getting nearer and nearer together. So inevitably, some patients will be co-infected. That is highly significant. Uh, now, this is a disease that comes and goes, comes and goes, goes up and down, and this is, these are the factors, serious economic instability. Basically, if you have disruption of case surveillance, and if you have, especially in war, and you have poor vector control, uh, you get a resurgence of the disease. Uh, in terms of reservoirs, uh, animals are the reservoir for the East African form. In fact, in cattle, they have three animal species to one human species, Rhodesiense. Uh, in, in the Gambiense, which is 95% uh, of, of cases, uh, as opposed to 5%, human beings are the main reservoir. So, in other words, if you can isolate uh, cases, treat them, you prevent uh, transmission. That's why during war, you get big problems. There are other factors that financial allocation, drug resistance, all these things. Population movements have been important uh, in uh, Uganda. For example, uh, between two areas, Soroti and Tororo, when infected cattle are moved from one area to another, you get outbreaks of the human disease. This is due to the human um, uh, species being, uh, being brought in different areas. This, in fact, shows uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, instance. And what is interesting is you see how high it was initially at the early in, the, in, in the 20th century. At that time, uh, and actually when Bruce was, uh, was going out there, literally hundreds of thousands of people were being wiped out, especially in the Uganda of Stephen Stephen, wiped out. Uh, absolute disaster. And then initially because of mass culling procedures and also uh, deforestation, then followed by better parasite um, uh, 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 vector control and case surveillance, in the sixes, it was almost eradicated. But then, in fact, it came uh, up right back and became much more common. Uh, I was just joking, actually. This looks a little bit like my sort of publication profile. You know? uh, don't check, please. But basically, this, in fact, shows that, you know, that it has come back. And more recently, as you'll be seeing, it's come down. Now, these statistics are interesting. 
1998, the World Health Organization reckoned about 300,000 cases. But then, because of partnerships between the World Health Organization and private organizations, government organizations, NGOs, this came down uh, to 50 to 70,000 cases. 2009, less than 10,000. This is tremendous news, fantastic achievement, but there are difficulties in underreporting and underdiagnosis uh, because in getting to regions which are not accessible, you, you can get a uh, 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 lack of diagnosis. In the, in, in, the door, in the DRC, there were more than twice as many cases as were reported, a recent paper in PLOS NTD. The other thing, occur, cases occur in non-endemic countries. Over a decade, 94 people were reported, uh, mainly in Europe, but also in North America. But of these patients, most of them are Rhodesiense and few Gambiense, so it's not the same picture as people who are endemic. This is the beasties, as you see. Um, they, uh, we won't go into the, into the biology of these, uh, but these, uh, these, uh, uh, these are nevertheless, they're, they're very effective predators, and they're about 30 microns long. Uh, that's uh, a picture of a tsetse fly. Uh, they're big, and their, their bite is extremely painful. I personally have never been bitten by a tsetse fly. That's either because uh, I've been lucky or else they have no taste. I don't know which. And basically, uh, the area held captive, 11 million square kilometers. The area infected by the tsetse fly has not gone down by more than about 10% over the last 100 years. Farming is impossible. And of course, this was this relationship with the human disease, because not only because of the fact that animal trichomonas uh, is a can be uh, is related to human, but also that if humans are affected, they can't farm. That's a third of Africa, and that is a massive area. Now, that's the USA, okay, which is about 9.6 million square kilometers. In fact, it's slightly more than, than the area of the USA. That's the Tessy Belt. Big problem. This is the life cycle from, from the CDC. All you need to know is that once the flies get into the blood, it spreads there in the blood, lymph nodes, liver, uh, spleen, and then after about three, three weeks or so, it gets into the central nervous system by crossing the blood-brain barrier. And then when the, when the um, uh, testified bites, what happens is that it becomes more infective uh, as it, uh, in the mid-gut of the, uh, of the fly. There are structural pharmacological biochemical changes which result in a highly infective form being in the salivary glands, which is great. So when they bite, they've got the maximum infectivity. This is a, a tsetse trap. I mean, I've been to Africa uh, 23 times now, um, uh, over uh, since 1988, something like that, um, long time. And um, and this is a tsetse trap. Uh, flies are very attracted to blue. Uh, I used to always, I like wearing blue, uh, but when I found this out in 1998, I always made sure I never wore blue or black in the in the field. And what happens is the flies are attracted. Uh, they're attracted by ox's breath, which is put, uh, the very highly attracted ox's breath, and that gets them in, and the fly traps impregnated with, um, with, uh, with insecticide, and they go and die, called ingutra. The genome, uh, basically this has been sequenced, and the main thing is it's about 10,000 genes, so, you know, uh, we've only got about two and a half times more, but they've only, they've only got one cell. The main thing is that 10% encode the VSGs, uh, only one of which is expressed at any one time. Uh, the point is that there is uh, antigenic variation because of a constant low-frequency gene conversion process, so the genes switch in and out of the expression site. This is why it's, it's not being possible to uh, develop vaccines, and of course we see this in a variety of other uh, conditions, obviously, as you know.